And here we are. All right, I am getting started, and you are stopping talking now because really you have your first practice tomorrow, formative. We have much to get through today because finally I've had time to plan, Annie. So let's get started. Have your notebooks out. Have everything ready because I'm going to be very high paced today, very fast paced. All right. Now, first of all, house cleaning. House cleaning means announcements, clarifications, all sort of things. So first of all, it says site organization. I want all of you to help me. I am trying, as usual, to say what works best for them. Listen to me. This is possibly what the entire school will be using next year. By the way, those of you who, who sent me questions saying, Mr. Burrell, I didn't understand, blah, 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 and I wrote you back, some of you saying, I get the sense, I had the sense that you don't listen well in class because other students did it and they didn't need clarification. So those of you who don't listen well, I want you to start listening well, all right? Because I am asking all of you to help me. And if you're not listening, you can't help me, all right? As I was saying, SAS is dropping Blackboard next year. There are two major LMSs, learning management systems, that they are going to decide between. One of them is Moodle, one of them is Schoology. I need your, and, and what's the point of that? You should like go, yes, yes, yes. The point of that is, every teacher uses the same platform. You go to one place and all of your classes are there. And all of your homework is on that one place. Doesn't have to be Google Calendar because Google Calendar, as you'll notice, comes here. So all of your Google Calendar is here. You don't have to go to Google Calendar because it comes here. Right? So I am the person who is going to be showing this to the entire high school, saying, this is how me and my freshmen said it works best. So I need you to tell me because you use it. I'm trying to like think of what uh, a person who doesn't know my design experiences. So I'm thinking, first of all, that it's a good idea to do this. So here we are with housekeeping. This block over here, it's always on top. If it's open, you can collapse it, but it's always on top if it comes up. Notice I just added course readings folder here. You know that folder that had all the readings and textbooks and stuff? Well, this way, it's not cluttering up all of this place, this area down here. Okay? Does that make sense to you? It's just one less thing to look at down, down here. My goal is to have all of this stuff, Colin, all of this stuff really sort of disappear so that the only things you see are like, what am I doing today? And everything else that's always used will be in one little box linked over here. So notice, I have the readings folder, Google Drive, and our skills and standards, reading, writing, speaking, all there. You know where it is. It's over there in a nice little corner. What do you think? Is that a good idea? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Second, if you scroll down, my main man, Alex, already found it and used it, and I love him. Whoops. And I just closed it instead of trying to expand it. Anonymous feedback. Finally, I've been wanting to put this on here all along. Now, all of you should really, really pay attention to this one. This is a Google form. It's embedded here. And in it, it says, help me help you. My job is to teach. Your feedback helps. What works well, what doesn't, what can be improved. Okay? You can read my message here. Remember, it's anonymous, and it is. I only guessed that it was Alex because I just had a feeling. Uh, I don't know who you are, but I'd love you to leave your name so I can ask follow-up questions. If you have a good, constructive suggestion, if you're telling me, Mr. Brill, the way that you do this doesn't quite work well, I won't, I promise you, I won't take it personally. Instead, I will thank you, especially if you leave your name so I can say, as, who was it? It was, sorry guys, which person did I work with on? Oh, me. Okay, right, and so you know, I like hearing from students, how does this work, yeah. right? So in the same way, if you have criticisms of the way I teach, then if you leave your name there, I'll say, let's talk. Help it be better, all right? So that is always open. As soon as you put something in there, I don't know who you are unless you tell me. It comes to my Gmail, I read it, all right? I don't know why the principals and everybody else doesn't do the same thing. Some of us go crazy because they don't. Um, any other housekeeping? <coughs> ah, the database.
Okay, you're listening to me, right? And Jamie, it would help if you actually turned so that you were actually facing me instead. And Colin, you too. How many of you want uh, another five minutes to like understand what your social media data is? Okay, good. We'll do it. Because notice growth mindset. My promise to you is that by actually using the database, instead of me giving you memorization stuff like primary source, secondary source, tertiary source, factors of analysis, blah, 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 MLA formatting, blah, blah, all of this stuff, you just keep using it. And you're like, okay, I'm getting the way culture works now because I'm checking, oh, culture, writing, culture, common practices. My entry has to do with all of these things. So we'll go over it. The reason I put growth mindset and formative and learn by doing if you're freaking out about a grade, you don't have a growth mindset, and you also don't understand formative. I don't expect you to be good right now. I expect you to be good as you continue practicing, just the way a sports coach expects you to get better by practicing, doing it, practicing. And in that way, you will start becoming better and better and better at finding evidence, going, oh, this is really a good evidence for institutions, political institutions, I'm going to put that in the database because other people will find that interesting. And I'm going to help them find it by understanding how a database works. All right? So don't stress on the fact that this thing's going to be incredibly powerful. You're the first one. Picture it in three years. Because it will have all the data that you enter plus students that come after you. And so it will be a very, very, very powerful thing to help you all learn how to do uh, research. Glossary. I built this this morning between 3 and 5, and I'm going to demonstrate it to you right now. What's your homework? Outright. Because tomorrow you have your formative practice on your first informative paper. So you're going to write an outline according to standard, and you're going to bring it <coughs> tomorrow. I won't be here because I am leading this six-teacher World Studies 9 PLC to get everything done in one day that it would take us a year to get done if we didn't do it a smart way. Um, there will be a sub here. And she will give you some class, some time in class. Listen to me. You don't have to write an entire essay. I want you to write a title. Is this anything else? A title. An introductory paragraph. You listening to it? And two factors of Chinese history that you think are most uh, important to forming Chinese identity. We will go over that today. You're going to take notes and all that sort of stuff in order to be more clear on Chinese history because we haven't, you know, you've done reading and all that sort of thing, but we haven't consolidated it. And I haven't taught you a thing about Chinese. So uh, it's hot in here now. Whoever turned the aircon off, I'm up here sweating. So, let me show you how the glossary works. Hmm, outline. Why is that blue? And why does it have a question mark next to it? What if I press it? That's what my outline has to be. It pops up because the glossary auto-links to everything every time the word appears. Does anybody have any questions on that? So, if you, so you don't have to go, where was that outline rubric again? Because there it is. I put it there for you. All right? Does nobody think that's the least bit cool? You don't think it's cool? No. You don't? No, it's cool. No, I do. Oh. No, I do. What sort of grammar is that? <laughs> okay. Now, that's ugly because that's a picture. Now, oh, for the informative essay. Well, why is that? Because there's your informative essay rubric. It just pops up, right? And you just close it. Okay. And you close it, or you just get escape. Further. Follow the outlining rubric, and there's the rubric again, right? So every time you see that word outline anywhere, notice you don't have to click it, but if you're like, how does that outline thing work again? It's always there for you. Now, next, you have a choice right now, writing standards. Do you want to teach yourself? Because I put the rubrics for each one, what an A looks like, a B, a C, and a D. 
you do these things, you hit these targets, you get an A. Do you want to look at them yourselves and then ask me questions, or do you want me to teach at you? Raise your hands. I want to look at formal register and see if I can just get it without Mr. Burrell talking for 10 minutes about it. Because he has A right there. That's an A. If I do that little bit, that's an A. And I've got it. Do you really need Mr. Burrell to tell you what he wrote for you right there? That's formal register. Titles. Oh, Mr. Burrell told me. All of you look. Right? A, B, C, F. No title. Do you think I should just throw out the B, C, and F and just have the A level? A and B. Okay, because I can easily go into the glossary and delete that part. The the well, the, the, the C. I don't think. Well, I think well, you, you would you would know yeah. not what no what no what not not what. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what? Basically, it just says C is not B and A. This says title is mature and intriguing. S title is boring, not intriguing, and immature. So, do you really need to see that it's just not? What an A is? Come back to me when you look. Listen up. Come back. Come back to me once you've looked at it, and, and you can give me your opinion. Right now, just think about it. So okay. So how about how about you just look through these, click on them, look at it, and ask me about anything. Take take little notes somewhere so you can ask me clarifying questions in the next five minutes. Speak now about the writing standards. This is your chance. Don't send me an email saying, Mr. Burrell, I wasn't listening or paying attention or, or in your class mentally. Can you answer my email about the question that I have now? Ask it now. Yes? Okay, so like, admission about the five W's yep. and the, uh, I don't know what paragraph it was. The introduction. Yes, the introduction. And uh, it also mentioned something about a kitchen sink. There's two types. Well, yeah. Yeah. Do you explain the kitchen sink? Yeah. Uh, oh. Where's my limo? I will tell you one or the other. For right now, let's just do the five W's. Now, I will spend two minutes on this. Take notes on your introductory paragraph. Right, this, is a, this is writing skills, so go back to page 183 or 5 or whatever it is. This is very basic stuff, but listen to me. I'm trying to make you good writers, like excellent writers, by making you think about why writing is good, how it's good. Actually, you know what? For, does anybody want to ask about titles or formal register? Formal register, simply put, you write an SAT or an AP essay that uses in my opinion, I think you should, I believe, we all, if you use first and second person pronouns, you look like a middle schooler. Notice when you read your textbooks and those of you who read Murphy, they don't use first and second person pronouns. They never say in my, almost never say in my opinion, Megan, because we know it's your opinion because it's not a fact. China is the greatest country in the world. I don't have to say in my opinion because it's obviously my opinion if I write it. Okay? Thank you. Now, contractions. Don't write don't for a formal essay. Write what instead? Do not. Do not. Thank you. If you hand in something to me where China is not capitalized, spelling is sloppy, grammar is horrible, you vomited something very quickly on a page and then hit submit and gave it to Mr. Burrell to spend his time saying, oh, the poor thing doesn't know that China is capitalized, I'm going to take time out, then I will grade you as if you don't know basic capitalization. You never insult your teacher by not proofreading. It takes three or four minutes to look over every sentence you wrote and go, oh, 
I was sloppy there. I'll fix it real quick. It takes three or four minutes. Okay. Yes. Yes. It says no sign, but at what point is it considered sign? Good question. How about this as a rule? In the Army, we had this rule. This one's not vulgar. If you have to ask, is this okay, it's probably not. Does that make sense to you? If, you, if you're asking, oh, is this slang? It probably is. Find a more formal word. Those of you who are thinking, oh, formal means no voice and, no, no, yeah, and boring. Those of you who read Murphy, notice that guy has voice and he's formal, right? This is something for you to stretch toward, all right? How to, how to be formal and at the same time be really interesting, all right? It's the best. Now, any other questions on style? Uh, formal register. Now, if I say informal, that means relax, use I, use slang, whatever. So that's a journal, informal style. I do want to talk about titles for one minute. Did, I, did we do titles in this class? Kind of. Mm, we hinted at it. Did we look at JSTOR? No. no. Sniggering at this, yes, my my eternal torment. Very quickly, okay. What do you talk to each other? What was your? Nobody asked questions about this. Oh, I did. Theme hint colon topic or topic colon theme hint. Nobody asked questions about that. Really, you got that? That's very advanced. Okay, so it's the inform like an informative uh, piece where. Like, where do you come up with themes? Like, for formative, you can like make a theme such as like, oh, growing and all that. But like, for informative, where do you come up with the theme? For argumentative, you mean you have a theme, or for for narrative. But for informative, you're just like saying this. These are all the facts. I was talking to Miss Russell. Do you guys know Mrs. Russell? She's another. She's like the head of the World Studies 19, and she and I were planning tomorrow's release day for all the teachers. And uh, that's the day that we're planning everything, and I'm leading this, this holiday thing. And she said, I hate this, this whole language of informative essay, because there's always a theme. There's really always an argument. What's the argument that you're going to be making tomorrow, even though you're informing about China? Thank you, Al. The three, what is it, the two? Two. Okay, the two new factors that you think is like the best I, I wrote your mom saying, Alice is awesome, although every time she speaks, I have to ask her to speak. Speak up, Alice. What? <laughs> it's the two main factors that influence that civilization's identity. It's your opinion, and you're saying that this was the most important thing in shaping China's identity. So it is more than informative, isn't it, right there? So, uh, a good question. Again, in the spirit of formative, and this is week three, or whatever it is, relax. This is formative tomorrow. It's practice. You do your best, you get an A. And then I give you a 4321 for the rubric. But you do your best, you get an A for this assignment. But you still see what you would get if it was the real one in three and a half weeks or whatever it is. Yeah. Can you give us an example in that format? I will, right now. So I'm going to Jason. Okay, so it's we're doing China, which has no person named Confucius. <laughs> Let's see what we find. JSTOR, what is JSTOR, you ask? Oh, good question, thank you for asking. JSTOR is where scholars write, professors, they're the experts. Google, you could have a third grader writing their school report and you don't know and you quote a third grader because anybody can write on the web. JSTOR is my Google because these guys spend their lives thinking about this stuff and wondering about it and they're really like, they're the best. So, they're professors. So, notice this is a book review. Let me take out the book reviews. I don't want book reviews. What? Can I? Where is it? Oh, well, whatever. We'll just skim down here. Now, here's my prediction. We will see a lot of colon... Ah, what do you know? China and international harmony, colon. Now, is that a topic or a theme? 
China and International Harmony. It's a topic. The role of Confucius Institutes in bolstering Beijing's soft power. Now, don't... Confucius Institutes are schools all over the world. There's one in, in, in Singapore, the Confucius Institute. They teach Chinese language, culture, all sorts of stuff. And China, the Chinese government is putting them all over the world to spread Chinese culture. So, China and International Harmony. Maybe that's a thing. Don't worry too much. Just uh, tell me, look at this one. Consummation means like the ultimate, the, 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 the achievement of, of sorrow. An analysis of Confucius grief. I love this and I haven't read it. An analysis of Confucius grief, Jamie, for Yan Hui, who he loved, his favorite disciple. And Yan Hui died young, and he was his most promising student. And when his most promising student died young, better than all his other students, and he thought that this young man, who was poor and lived in an alley and was beggar poor, could become the king who would save China from its ruin. When Yan Hui died, Confucius wept, and he lost all control, and all of his other disciples were like, Confucius, you're totally, totally losing it. This is wrong. You're supposed to be dignified and everything, like a gentleman, like a Confucian. And Confucius said, what are you, yeah, and he defended his grief because he loved this, this student. The Consummation of Sorrow, an analysis of, uh, an analysis of Confucius' grief for Yan Hui. Which one's a theme, and which one's the hint at the, uh, which one's the topic, and which one's the theme? Thank you, Al. Uh, the analysis is the uh, topic, topic, and the sorrow is the theme. Do you see how it hints at what it's, it's getting at? This is like the ultimate, ultimate sorrow, right? So, okay, and is it not a nice hinting title that makes you like go, oh, I'm going to read about Confucius' grief when he lost his favorite student. This one's boring, on studies of Confucius. Okay, I don't want to read you if you're boring. My last one. Notice, we've looked at six, and maybe half of them or more, idols in the temple, icons and the cult of Confucius. Which is the topic and which is the theme? The theme is the idols in the temple, and the topic is the icons in the cult of Confucius. This is how adults write. Now, if you want to go, if you want to look at my blog, which got me jobs like paid jobs and flights to Australia because I like to write and I chose my titles. I stopped writing in 2009 when I came here to Singapore because this job is so much better than writing about education. I, I fell into China. But in any case, if you were to go to my blog, you would see titles that constantly do this theme hint, colon, topic, or vice versa. It's an art. It's a craft. It makes you look like somebody who is a writer and not a student. And there's a huge difference. All right? Did that clarify what a theme hint topic or topic theme hint is? Now, do all of them have to be that way? No. I showed this to my seniors and juniors. I should show it to you. Look at, the, look at the title of his blog. This blog he charged, he, he made one million dollars asking his readers. I've been, I've been writing, he said, for ten years now. I have a readership of like a hundred thousand people. Am I worth twenty dollars a year for each of you so that I no longer have to worry that advertisers will get angry if I write something controversial? Will, will you help me be free of all advertising pressure by paying me to be independent, and he made a million dollars in a month, all right, because he's that good. I paid him 50 instead of 20, because he's that good. He is my daily dish. I, he serves me every day. It's just delicious. Little bitty snippets of writing. Info snacks, we call them, but done well. Let's look at his titles. By the way, daily dish is a great title. I'm serving you, the metaphor, I'm serving you. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm cooking for you. I'm preparing for you. I want you to enjoy this. Is this a complete sentence? Nope. Lessons from a long time learner. What do we notice? This is informal, that's why I'm showing it to you. This is, this is informal, but it's still artful titles. What do you notice the difference between the formal that I just showed you, the professors, and this popular writing? Somebody besides Alex. Colin, what do you notice? That doesn't use a colon. Thank you, right? And it's perfectly okay to not use a colon. I don't want you every single time to use a colon, but I do want you to, because it can be informal too. Um, 
What do we notice about this title that makes it nice? Ignore him. What do we notice about this title that makes it nice? Jamie? Oh, what do we notice about this title, Jamie, now that you're here with us, that makes it nice? I want Jamie. It's not just, uh, like, it makes it interesting because it doesn't tell the whole story. It's just a snippet, and then that way you can want to read it. Okay. You're not, you're not looking at it very closely. Um, oh. Zach? Doesn't it sound good? Lessons from a long-time loner. Lessons from a long-time loner. I mean, you're right, Jamie, but just notice, right? He worshipped his way. Uh, Sometimes he's dirty. He is a Catholic, gay, conservative Obama lover. <laughs> Can you get any more paradoxical than that? Right? Catholic, gay, conservative Obama support. Uh, and he writes for Time Magazine. He's on TV all over the place. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Finding the words for wonder. Philosophize hard. Right? Just cool, cool hints at what's coming. Makes you want to go like, hmm, yeah, that. Does he write it, or just someone else? Does he, he has a staff. staff. Um, he pays a, 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 a small staff, there's like eight of them, and they just like scan the web for interesting stuff all day. But enough on that. If none of you, if any of you in this room found this not valuable, please see me after class because you're missing what I'm trying to teach you. Okay? There is nothing more important than starting strong with a well-crafted title. Because teachers see crap titles most of the time. All right? This is just like an easy, easy, like, I like you already and I haven't read your first paragraph. Get your drone on in church. What? Scripture is overrated. What a cool title. Don't you want to read that? The Bible's overrated. What? Don't you want to? And he's a Christian. Okay, so, back to introductory paragraph for right now. I want the basic, five W's. You situate the reader. What does my reader need to know before I start writing about my main idea? So I want the basic right now. They need to know what I'm talking about, the five W's, where it is, who's important, when it happened, who, what, where, when, and why. And if you're really good, you have your thematic angle already. If you're really good, while you're giving the who, what, where, when, why, let me see, what do we have? I'll come back to it because I want to move on. Um, I will come back to it. It's formative, all right? Any other questions on these things? Any questions on a thesis claim? Any questions on a topic sentence claim? On evidence to prove your argument? And on warrant, which just connects your evidence to your argument? Confucius was a man with a great, massive heart. When Yan Hui died, he lost control. No, no. Here's a quote about Yan Hui's death. What do you mean, blah, blah, blah? I've given evidence. Well, let me now explain how that proves that he had a great heart. That's warrant. Warrant is a $5 word for explaining your evidence. When we say your opinion is unwarranted, that means it doesn't make sense. Can I move on? You okay? We will come back to concession and defense later. This yeah. is a very high skill, but it simply means it simply means I know that my argument is limited, and I'm not going to pretend it's not. I'm going to just flat out say it with words like, granted, this argument is not perfect because, semicolon, nonetheless, it's still worth making because, defense. If you try to hide the weakness of your argument, your smart reader thinks you look dumb. If you instead identify the weakness of your argument, your smart reader goes, that's a smart writer. Because they themselves know that the argument is not perfect, and they address it, and they still go on to defend. Still, within the limits that it is good, there's a lot to be said here. Yes? Is it kind of like at first glance, once again, that? Is that kind of? It's, it's not really. Uh, 
hopefully you start with that first glance on second thought, because it's on second thought is, thank you for asking. So, so once you start going with your on second thought, democracy is really not a great system. Wow, really? Here is a concession. Granted, there is a lot of promise in democracy, and there's a lot of good. Semicolon. However, there's more bad than good in the real world, period. All right? We'll practice this. This is, this is, uh, this is not that advanced. Don't you do this all the time when you really argue? Don't you like go, well, I know it's not, you know, I mean, I, I know that. I know it's not perfect. Don't you do this when you really argue? So this is just, when you write, you do the same thing. It's called being honest. I'm not trying to BS. That's what it's called. And then conclusion. I think the middle school teachers are really good. I expect that you know not to go, in conclusion, if you, if you start your concluding paragraph with in conclusion, I will, like, blindfold, Zaina, I will blindfold your in conclusion, start of your conclusion, and give it a cigarette and a last meal, and I will shoot it. Because in conclusion, comma, is just the most, like, sixth grade introductory statement for a conclusion. So, in sum, there's any number of things besides the in conclusion, which makes you sound like a third grader giving a book report. Don't use it. Nobody does. There are other ways to do it. The second thing not to do is, as we have seen, I have just argued A, B, and C. The end. That's boring. Take it somewhere. Confucius was indeed one of the biggest hearted humans on this planet. Let me take that somewhere. That was the argument of my whole plan. If only today's philosophers and today's leaders had similarly large hearts, perhaps we would have a better world. Period. I just opened out to today. I did something with it in one sentence. We'll practice it. Okay? Notice I did return to thesis. He has a big heart. But then I extend it. Let me take it forward. Let me do something. Here we go. Yep. Can you read just that two sentences? It can, it, it can be. Again, this is four minute, right? We're on the sports field. This doesn't. You do your best. You get an A for this thing. You you. Sh if it doesn't smell like you were lame and didn't prepare or think at all, you get an A on this because it's just a homework grade. We've got a month to ask about the finer points of it, and we will. Yes, Zach. So we. Just to um, be sure, we're writing about the two factors of the Chinese history. Does that have to be on what we took notes on? Or could it be anything? By the end of this class, I'm hoping that you will have... How many of you, how many of you would like to... How many of you would like to hear the history of China expert at this school actually going over archaic and classical China? Okay. Now, you've read your introductory chapters. All right. How many of you found, well, uh, so Zach, at the end of this, at the end of this, hopefully, my goal is for you to go, geez, there's a lot of interesting stuff here. Which two are the most interesting two? Most interesting, M-I, most interesting thing. Which two to me were the most interesting and the most important in really shaping China? first concept I want to talk about is one of the, hey Sid, you want to be attentive, pen, outline, and your formal indentation style. Right again, I will collect your journals because I have not been teaching you good, fast, brief outlining, indentation levels, main idea, indent, no more than five words per line. Oh, he's still talking about that, but he's adding more details. I'll indent one level further, all right? Do your best on proper outline form. And I will do my best to be so organized that you actually like go, oh, I should indent here because he's giving me signal words. Here we go. Our first major concept, and I said the word concept, what's the lesson number? 15. You tell, don't ask me, tell me. 15. It's 15. Yeah. So, okay. So, and our, our subject is? 
This is this is China review. We got plenty of time. We're doing good. Yep, we're doing great. Our first concept is geographic determinism. This one's cool. Write the word determine, like I'm determined, and just add ism at the end. Geographic determinism. I thought I would be all cool by just going full screen for you, but instead I just made it a two-page view, which I don't want to fight. Determinism is a really interesting word, and we're going to talk about all sorts of determinisms. Have we talked about this concept before? Yes. What does it mean? What's a good synonym for to determine? you or me or whatever. How about to shape? Who said it? Two points for Alex. To shape. To shape. Geographic determinism. How does... Now, by the way, your job in this class is to always go, Mr. Brown, I've already done that. I will love you. Don't let me sit here and, and waste time if we've already had this concept. All right, so geographic determinism. How does geography shape China? Have we had this conversation? Let's have it very quickly. Look at this map. These are the first river valley civilizations. The very first cities on the entire planet bubbled up on four rivers. You should have known this from like middle school. The Nile in Egypt, the Tigris Euphrates, the Indus in India, and the yellow in China. There's the yellow. Notice it's the one, there's two major rivers in China. It's the one up north by the chicken's neck, right? It comes out of the chicken's neck, the yellow river. That's the cradle of Chinese civilization. What already do you see, looking at the map, that shows you that already China is being shaped by geography? Please, hands. It's obvious. Compared to the Indus, where India started, the Tigris-Euphrates, where eventually the Bible would be written, and Egypt, where all the pharaohs were. What's different about China compared to the other three? It's obvious. Lale, since you're looking at your table, I'm going to ask you to look at me and answer the question. Um, I don't know. Huh? I, I missed that. I can't hear you. I missed that. Um, okay. Because you were spacing out? No, I was, I was just... Uh... What was my question? It was to do with the yellow river. Okay, all right. You will, you will succeed or fail in life based on whether or not you can just keep your attention focused. All right? If you need to sit further up in front in order to do that, be smart and do that. Those of you who have a hard time with wandering attention, police yourself. I shouldn't sit in the back of the room. I should sit in the front of the room because I know myself. I roam. I wander. Now, what's the obvious difference? It's by the coast. That's by the coast. All rivers are by coasts. But thank you for playing. Both. It's isolated from the rest of the civilization. Thank you. Notice these red lines are showing that they're all making contact with each other, but not China. China is over here by itself. Geographic isolation. We've already got the word geographic, so why write it again? Isolation. That's our first determining factor. Shaping Chinese identity. You don't need to write these things down because you're not taking a, a Chinese history in depth course. But why is it so isolated? Why can't India, which is after all right next to China, why can't it and China make contact? Because the Himalayas are here. So these are the geographic terrain features that keep China, what I call, a different world on the same planet. And it really is. For over a thousand years, for over a thousand years, China had no contact with India 
It had no idea there were any other civilizations on the planet. Allison, you're scaring me because your pen is not moving. Do you have a single note? Okay, good. That was an honest question. The Himalayas are here. You've got desert, desert, mountains. China is blocked off from the rest of the planet. This may as well be empty space here. Because getting from India or these places to China is like walking to the moon. It may as well be empty space. And for thousands of years, China will look around and go, we're the only civilization there is. Yes? Is that why like, China kind of discovered all of the basic, like, how it they, uh, went further in technology while the other, like, other civilizations were doing the same, but it was still doing the same regardless of it being separated? That is a really, really good question. Did that help China make all sorts of discoveries and, and advance compared to other civilizations? Was that your question? Yeah. Well, you tell me. Don't you hate me? Whoops. There is an argument to be made there. Uh, yes, Alex? Um, does geographic determinism also include the, like, the minerals and what they can dig up? Like the gold? Like, no, that's resources. That's inside. Oh, yes, it does. It does. you think that China was completely isolated, oh crap, here's China, here's the other civilizations. This green area here is a very important geographic determiner for China. What do you call grassland that nomads wander on? It's got a word just like mountain and river and desert. Plain? Plain. No, it's, it was like the You're close, you're close. Set, 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 no. S-T? Step. Step. Step, good. Grassland and living in yurts, in tents. This grassland is really important because nomads, like schools of fish, follow herds of cattle back and forth, and they're always wandering around. They don't live in cities or villages. Give me one second. And so, there are different groups of herding tribes following their cows or sheep or yaks or goats or whatever around as those cattle graze the grassland. You just saw a picture of the rolling grassland. As soon as the cattle have eaten that grassland dry, that pasture, they move on to look for more pasture because they live off the animals that they follow around in herd. These people have to be good at what, besides following animals around? Since they're constantly roaming around and they never know who they're going to run into, what do they have to be really good at? Jamie? Like, They've got to be good at moving. Yeah. That's exactly right. And because there are other groups just like them wandering around, what else do they have to be good at, Colin? Fighting. Fighting. Nomads are mobile and warlike. Mobile. Fast on horseback fast on horseback, good with bow and arrow, on horseback, and warlike because they have to be able to defend themselves against other nomads because you never know when you're going to run into them. Those nomads can go like, wow, they got a nice, they got a nice flock, and they got nice women, let's take both of them. And that's what they did, right? Yes, Alex? Are they considered like the uh, hunters and gatherers? No, because they are pastoralists. This is a good word if you want it. Like pastor at church, P-A-S-T-O-R. A pastor is a shepherd, right? At church, you're the flock, right? And the pastor is the shepherd of your flock. So pastoral is related to the word pasture, right? Pastor, pasture, flocks. Eat grass and pastures. So this type of person is between hunter-gatherers who don't know how to domesticate animals and follow them around, so they have to hunt them. we got to find animals to kill. No, we these guys just follow around, and we just kill them when we're hungry, right? They're always with us. Pastoralists. Nomadic pastoralists. That's that type of society. Nice, smart question, Alex. Yes? I remember the nomads coming up in the textbook because, like, one, one time they had, like, I don't know what they were fighting over, but them and the Chinese were fighting. They had a, like a war between each other, and my thing 
thing was tools, and the Chinese used tools like to build weapons and like, iron because they were good at metalworking, and so they used tools to make weapons. And yeah, because weapons. because they had to defend themselves against these nomads who were always up here in the steppe land, but you never know where, and you never know when, and you never know which one. Because, again, my favorite metaphor for this is schools of fish. All of these little tribes of nomads are like a different school of fish. Most people think, oh yeah, the Mongols. That's only one nomadic tribe. There are others. You don't have to write them down, but you've all heard of Genghis Khan and the Mongol Empire. Well, they started up here. But they wander around and you never know. But they really liked coming into North China because they were like, wow, look at those cities with pretty women and nice silk and a lot of food and a lot of riches and horses and all sorts of things. Yeah, let's just raid them, right? You think it's easy for China to call its army and go chase the nomads? No, because they're fast on horseback. They don't have wagons. They're on horseback. China's like taking its wagons out after them, you know, its, it's foot soldiers. Why are we talking about this? What effect do nomads have when you never know when they're going to come and raid you? What effect is that going to have on your civilization? Thank you, Noah. Fear. Fear. More? Fear, oh. more alert. And so what actions are you going to take? So, you start building fortifications and defense. Like defense. The Great Wall of China. Defense. Do you think they're worried about the Pacific Ocean being a weak spot? No. no. They're always, always. What's their biggest defense up, defense up north? Everybody knows this. Great the Great Wall. The Great Wall. The Great Wall. Why did they build that thing? Because they like building walls from New York City to Seattle. That's how long it is. That's how long it is from New York City to Atlantic to Pacific. No, because these bloody nomads, man, we've got to keep them from, from raiding us. They will constantly come into China. They're an unpredictable threat. Moving on. Geographic determinism. The nomads will make China always nervous about the north, and that is the only neighbors that they see. Everywhere else they look, nobody's civilized. What effect is that going to have when you look around and you see every, everybody that's not Chinese is not civilized? What effect does that have on your identity? Alice? Really confident. The, the country itself is really confident in its own abilities. Really confident? Mm -hmm. uh, to the point where it's like, I, Alice, speak up. To the point where it's, it's ridiculously arrogant. Okay. Possibly a cockiness, an arrogance, uh, a sense of superiority. After all, what does China call itself? Anybody here know what Zhongguo means? Uh, middle country. We're middle country. The middle of the world. We're the middle. We're the middle of the world because everywhere we look, there's nothing. There's no civilization. It's here. We're the center of the universe in the world. You can't blame them because they were right. Everywhere they did look, there were nomads, or down here in the south, there were savages, primitives. Okay. What is the effect of this isolation? What are the positives of it? Getting back to Naharika's question, notice we're moving on now. Effects of isolation. Positives? Anybody have any suggestions? Nadia, can you think of any positives of like, oh, India and, and Mesopotamia and Egypt and Greece? They don't come in our neighborhood. What are the positives there, Nadia? Give me one. You won't have to like, have so many like, war and stuff. Exactly. There's no major major armies invading us. That's pretty cool. What's the why is that a, a good thing in one way? If you're not being invaded constantly, except besides from nomads who What is that what is that how does that help your civilization? Colin, thank you. Population grows. Population grows, what else? There's more and more and more. Uh, Jamie. Um, civilization increases. Like more things are made. Because you don't have to focus on war. Do you, do you agree that, that as long as you keep the nomads out, things are peaceful on their, on your core of civilization? And if things are peaceful from generation to generation, what advantage does your civilization have? Getting back to Naharika's question. The culture can develop because it's not getting invaded and stopping everything, possibly destroying everything, having to start over, all that sort of stuff. Right? So a positive is peace and stability. Anybody think of any negatives to this isolation? I can. There's a lot to think about. Zach? Um, it's not as easy to trade with other countries. 
Thank you, trade, first of all. You're assuming that trade is good, and I suppose it is. You'll be surprised to hear China doesn't think it is. You'll be surprised to hear China does not think trade and making money is good. Uh, ancient China. What besides trade is also kept out? Thank you, uh, Jamie. Oh, I was going to say the military and army aren't that, you know, aren't that good. Because if anything does happen, they won't be ready. They might have a weak army because they never really have had to fight big, massive, equally powerful armies. That's a really, really valid warrant you just made. You just reasoned about the evidence, and that's your warrant. This lack of any major military foe might make their army surprisingly weak. Right? I'll just throw one in there, too. Notice, do you think they even ever had a navy? Because the Pacific Ocean's there, right? There's, really, there's nothing there. Korea didn't become civilized until 800 A.D. Japan didn't become civilized until 800 A.D. So they were never threats for the first 2,000 years of Chinese history, right? India down here, Himalayas. Who needs a fort? I've got the highest mountain in the world between us and India. Um, Alex? Um, no, not much of a growth mindset. Yeah. Um, I think it's better. Say more, say more. Because... They can't learn from each other's technology. They can't learn from whose technology? China can't learn from? Neighboring. China can't learn the good ideas. Now, here's a thank you. You came up to the next little circle on my, my notes. And notice, look at my notes. Do you, see how, do you see how short and indented and such my notes are? They're longer than they should be, because I did this at 4 or 5 this morning at the Hawker Center. But in any case, um, this term of... It's not just trade. Zach brought up trade. Also, when traders go from one culture to another, besides taking their, their merchandise, what else do they take? That's idea, idea, ideas. ideas. So this word is, this concept, massively important, cultural diffusion. Cultural diffusion. When cult Diffusion means spreading, dispersing. If I have baby powder in my palm and I go like this, it diffuses, it spreads, it disperses. So cultural diffusion, the spreading of ideas and from one culture to another. Religions, conventions, fashions, music, art styles, all of this stuff. Cultural fusion. China won't learn from other cultures. I am done with this part. We are moving on now to the actual history, because we just did geography. Now let's talk about the Shang Dynasty. Periodization. That's our first major concept in our new section, so you should go back to the margins. Periodization. Period. I-Z-A-T-I-O-N. Periodization. In the database, and we'll get back, guys, don't worry about the database. If we don't have time to do the database today, we've got time tomorrow. It's, it's all like growth mindset. It's formative, right? We'll fix it. Um, what is the earliest seed level of human civilization. It's in your database. It says like something like era or period. What's the earliest one? Archaic. 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 Think of archaic as the seed. That's my metaphor, and it's a helpful one. I asked you to talk in metaphors when you presented your, your uh, psychology ideas, or similes, or analogies. The archaic period of any civilization is the seed, the acorn. It's a very s small beginning, but it is a beginning of China, and it's the Shang Dynasty. The classical era is when that seed becomes a tree, right? When that acorn becomes an oak tree. The classical era is like, I've got my major shape now. Later, medieval and, and modern, we'll get to that later. Picture branches and fruit, right? But it all starts at the seed. So that seed really does stay, continue, and change into the classical. Our first archaic, as you know, is the Shang Dynasty. These are all maps, I think. Yeah, so. The first thing I want to talk about with the Shang Dynasty is this. Writing? Now you take, yes, script. Stop. Oh, I hate you so much. Okay, not you. 
I mean, you know, oracle bones. Shang Dynasty invented Chinese script, Chinese writing. Fascinating, fascinating, fascinating. How many of you are Mandarin students? Chinese students. All right. What do you call it, this type of script, that is pictures instead of letters? Characters. Characters is close. Pictograph. Pictographs. This is a pictographic script. Their original characters were pictures of things. To give you evidence, that's the original tree. Looks like a tree. Roots, branches. Shang Dynasty. Here it is today. It's just evolved. It's changed over time. Seed, fruit. Right? Um, that looks like a half moon. There's moon today. It evolved over time. Yeah. I won't tell you that the word for ancestor was a penis. I just did. It's literally a picture of a penis. And you know why that matters? Because when we think of our dead, important people in our family, what do we reveal by showing the penis as the important dead members? What do we reveal about our culture and society? This is history. I'm not being very... Alice. It means that they probably like, it's Hurry and male. Thank you. Patriarchy. Write it down. Patriarchy. This is a patriarchal society. Male dominated. Paternal, maternal, patriarchy. P A T R I A R C H Y. Patriarchy. First, about this, this uh, script, I'm going to talk about its political effects. How, do they, how does this script sh shape Chinese history? I'm going to make this argument that the little Shang dynasty on this river there were other, I told you, primitive tribes down south and such, that spoke different languages. If you look at China today, there's 55 different language groups in China. Did you know that? There's 55 different language groups in China. Is it dialects? Most of them, no, it's not dialects. It's separate languages. And most of them are in the south, but that doesn't matter. And you know what makes them still Chinese and able to communicate with the Chinese? Before that, this goes back to the seed. How did these people learn to communicate? They wanted to because they could trade with China and get rich because the Shang was rich and all these others were primitive, as I told you. Because they see this picture of a tree and no matter what language they speak, if the word for tree is golipo in this group and pilopau in this group, they still see tree and when they write it, they're like, golipo, and you read it and you go, that tree. Pilo pal, right? <laughs> and then you go up to China and you're like, what's the word for tree in China? Fu. Fu, right, right? And so they can write even though they can't talk. So here's the very important point. The culture spreads through the script because it's a bridge across languages. It unites across languages. Now, if I go up to the guy who, who says poli po for tree and I go, hey, we don't speak the same language, but if I just write this, that'll work. Even if you know the alphabet, it doesn't sound like polypo, so the alphabet separates. It's a wall between language groups. Do you see that? The pictures are a bridge between different language groups. They can all like still like write the pictures and go, yeah, we're talking, we're communicating. We're not talking, we're communicating. The alphabet does the opposite. If I write an English letter in the, in the English alphabet to somebody who's Norwegian, they have no idea what I'm writing. They can just bark at it like a dog going, pictographic logo. Do you get what I'm saying? The alphabet separates language groups. China's script unites. And so the Chinese culture can grow multiculturally and absorb people. You talk about a melting pot. Look what the language does. I'm sorry, the script. 
if across language groups it unites. Here's a puzzle for you. There are 4,000 characters already in the Shang oracle bones. 4,000 characters. Some of them have 20 strokes. Jamie, how long do you think it would take you to learn 4,000 characters, some of them with 20 strokes? Sorry, I always want to... Megan, how long do you think it would take you to learn 4,000 characters? Who do you think has a long, 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 long time to learn to read and write and be literate? Someone does because it happens. Students. People who chose to be academics. You're not thinking. Think real hard. I'm saying that it, it unites across language groups, but it divides within Chinese society itself. It actually makes a social division between who and who. Nahara. Who has time to learn to read and write, and who does not have time? Years and years and years of daily study. The rich people? The rich have the time, and the poor don't, because they're farming. And so, from the beginning, Acorn, until the Communist Revolution 60 years ago, the literacy rate in China was about 10%. 90% of China was illiterate because the farmers had no time to learn to read and write. Twelve years before I was born, this is true, and it was true for 3,000 years of Chinese history. That's another consequence. Socially, the language creates an elite. If you can write, you have power. You can work for the government. You can do all sorts of things. If you cannot read and write, you don't have power. This pictographic system, advantages, disadvantages, how does it shape Chinese identity? If you're rich, Boy, does it open doors for you. If you're poor, boy, does it shut doors for you. All right? Moving on. What were these bones used for? Really? A minute ago, you were, you were doing all sorts of stuff. Oh, there you go. Oh, hell and damnation. Pat yourself on the back if you were going to say this because I'm looking at the clock. They were used because, and draw a picture of this. This is the religion of China, the Shang Dynasty's religion. The king had somebody write this, and these are questions to who? His dead ancestors. And then they got a hot bronze poker, and they poked it into the, 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 the bone. And as you read, I'm sure, the bone cracks, and somebody reads the crack, and they interpret it. That's the will of the gods. The Greeks read the flight of birds. If the birds flew from right to left, that was good, and left to right was bad. The Romans looked at the, the intestines of chickens and read those. People read tea leaves and stars and astrology and horoscopes today. They're all for trying to tell the future. So they thought, oh, here's how. You, you burn a hot poker, you stick it in there, it makes a crack, and depending on the crack, it's yes or no, good luck or bad luck. This is the earliest communication of China, living to dead, humans to the divine, and the afterlife. It shows us a lot in seed. First, what does it show us? Who are the main characters here? Now you think critically about it. Think analytically about it. Break it down. Who are our main characters in this communication act between the heavens and who's... Give me one main character. Uh, the oracle is just the God. Who is the oracle? That's a good question. Who's asking the questions here? To heaven? The king. The king. Okay. And who is he asking the questions to? His fathers, typically. Ancestors. What were they when they were alive? Kings. Okay, so these are royal ancestors. They were, they're dead kings. But they're still around. And... They were thought to talk to who? The god. And the god's name was Shangdi. You know, it's this Shang. Let's see. Yeah, it's that Shang. Yeah, it's that Shang. Shangdi. Um, so, and that just means high god. Above, god above.
How many things are there to notice about this? One, besides God, there's another important thing going, another important concept going on here, and it's what includes these two actors. What's the concept that includes those two? A simple concept. Advice. Huh? Advice. I can't hear you. Advice. More, more, more basic. Life after death. More, no, he's not dead. I've done the last Dudes. Those guys are family, right? Son. Parent. Father. Father. Grandfather. Grandfather. Going all the way back. Notice what is already so closely connected to God. God and family. I'm going to make the claim to you that family is a religious concept to China as important as God, and in fact more important than God. Family is God, and we will get there when we see the Shang Dynasty die. This Shang Di did not make the universe. He's like Zeus. He's not like the Christian God. He didn't create the universe. He's like Zeus. He's a war god and all sorts of stuff. How do we make God happy? So that he'll do good things for us, help us win wars, give us good weather, all that sort of stuff? Offerings. offerings, thank you. Those offerings are, let's put another word in here because we're really hitting important DNA for China. Offerings are, what's the, what's the specialized word for ceremonies that are religious? R-I-T, rituals. rituals. These are all... You know, you know which one of these is going to disappear from China's history and not continue on? God's going to die, but family and ritual are going to stay. And now we're looking at Confucius in 600 years. Ritual. If the king does not do these offerings well, it's like you giving me sloppy homework. How dare you be so, so, so uncaring about me that you're doing a sloppy sacrifice. And so the ancestors will tell Shangdi, punish him, because he is not proper. The term I want you to fall in love with like I have is the term of ritual propriety. It's not just ritual. It is doing it well. It's caring about it. Doing it well. Not dishonoring those that you're doing sacrifices for by doing it sloppily. Now let's talk political seeds. Notice I just did. You should all be going, okay, we just went from religion to politics. The political seeds of the Shang Dynasty. You have the king. And the king has a big territory on the Yellow River. How does he rule it in an age where really the chariot is just getting started, it's the first civilization, it's the first cities, they're not real developed yet. Yep? Divided cities? You divide it into, you give territories to... What do you think the V stands for? Vassal. What is a vassal? Anybody know this term? Here's our major, here's our major uh, what's the Shang political system? Feudalism. So here's our major concept now. The political system of archaic China is feudal. You've heard of European feudalism, right? That's like the Middle Ages, all that sort of stuff. Feudalism. How does it work? By politics, we mean how do we control a large territory? The king would give an area of land to somebody he trusted, typically a family member, or else a powerful general that maybe helped him win his kingdom in the first place. So either a powerful military man or a family member. So I, can, I don't want to piss off the powerful military man. I want him on my side, so I'll give him a big territory. And I want, I can trust my family. So these are called vassals, people who are given land. The king says, it's yours. You just be loyal to me.
the land that he gives, this is our last vocab word for this political system, and it's true of, of Japanese history, of European history, fief. This is the land itself, the territory that is given to the vassal. The king gives the vassal a fief, a big chunk of land, and says it's yours as long as you're loyal to me. That's feudalism. That's it. Yes. Yes, Joe was, was over here. It was a thief over here. So the Joe was was uh, a, the Joe thief of the of the shop. Now, some synonyms. These are such basic terms. How does this vassal, okay, when this vassal dies, who gets the land? Huh? Successor, okay, who's the successor? Just some guy who walks yeah, up and goes, hey, can I have a son? Okay, so it is inherited, is it not? It's hereditary, is it not? So this is what an aristocracy is. A hereditary class. Daddy was given a lot of land, so when he died, I got a lot of land. And when I die, my son will get a lot of land. It stays in the family. We are the aristocracy. We are the nobility. Same meaning. Aristocracy, nobility. Do you know the two words already, Zach? Cool. There's one last thing to notice here. Who is God's representative on earth? The king. We're, we're not yet at empire yet, but it's a monarchy, but it's okay. The king is the person who has a monopoly on God. Who is he like in Western? Pope. 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 Explain why. Good. Why? I don't know. Who said Pope? I did. Somebody else did first. Oh, Pope. Because? Because they asked him to give the Lord. Because the Pope is the only person in the Catholic religion that can talk to God, or that has direct connection to God. In China, the king is. What's the difference between the Pope's social role or social class and the Chinese kings? They have this similarity. They both are God's representative on earth. But. But there's a, there's a, huge, a huge social difference. And I, this is also from that day to this. Really important. Well, the king kind of leads the king. The king is the political ruler. Yeah. The Pope, meanwhile, belongs to not the political class, but the religious. religious class. And religious authorities are called. You go to church and see him every every priests. Sunday. Priests. The Pope is the, the high priest. He's the priest class. Notice what we don't have in China. Social effects, no priest class. There will never be a priest class in China saying, King, you're wrong, I speak for God, and you're wrong. China will never have church and state conflicts because there will never be a priest class that speaks in the name of God against the ruler, the king. Obama can't, Obama can't like, go out for a cup of coffee without getting some sort of religious you know, flack from priests in America about something or other. Oh, you're you're doing condoms in your in your in your health care plan. That's against our religion. Obama, Obama oh God, I gotta deal with the plea, the priest. There is no priest class in China. Socially, that's a huge difference. Now, notice just in the song, how many different shapers of Chinese identity did you just see? If you don't have a priest, a religious authority, when you are born, grow old, and die. What difference might that make on your identity? When the king has all the power of both priest and king, what difference might that make on your identity? On and on and on. Just from what is in your notes right now, I want you to go home, I want you to make an outline, and I want you to bring it back so that you can write two body paragraphs. What are your, what are your choices? Geographic isolation? Um, Scripture. Script. The, the politics, the religion, notice the whole ancestor thing, the royal family, all sorts of stuff. So this is just practice, right? So you're going to practice working on an introduction that's basic, five W's. Yes? Click on outline rubric and tell me why you didn't ask this question earlier when I was saying look at all of that and ask. Yeah, for right now, let's just do it on the notes that we took today. All right? So we don't even, like, it's just a shot. Sure. 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 Sure.
Don't. 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 Don't.